ሰላም ተመልካቾቻችን እንደምን ሰብታችኋል እንግዲህ ካለፈው ሳምንት እንደቀጠለው የዛሬም ሄለን ሾው ዝግጅት በጁላይ 1st ዋሽንግተን ዲሲ ኮንቬንሽን ሴንተር ሰባተኛው አመታዊ ኢምፓወር ዘ ኮሚኒቲ ዊክንድ ላይ ቀርበው ከነበሩት ፓወር ፓነል ዲስከሽን አንደኛው ነው ይዘንላችሁ የቀረብነው ይሄ ዲስከሽን እንግዲህ ቢዝነስና ሊደርሺፕ ላይ ያተኮረ ነው በጣም ትልልቅ ሐላፊነት ላይ ያሉ ኢትዮጵያውያን ኤርትራኖች በተለያዩ የአሜሪካ ኩባንያ ጎቨርመንት ኢንስቲትዩሽን የራሳቸውንም ድርጅት የሚመሩ እንግዶችን ነው ይቀበዝንላችሁ ጠቃሚ ሐሳቦችን ያካፈሉበት መድረክ ነው እንግዲህ ይሄ ቆይታ እዚ አሜሪካን ሀገር ስለሚደረግ ኢትዮጵያውያኖች ብቻ አይደለም የሚሳተፉበት አሜሪካውችም ሌላ አፍሪካን ሀገር እንግዶች ይሳተፉበታል ስለዚህ ዝግጅቱ የቀረበው በእንግሊዝኛ ነው እስቲ ወደዛ ፕሮግራም ልሰዳችሁና ቆይታችን ከኛ ጋር እንድታደርጉ አጋብዛችኋለሁ Thank you Helen thank you everyone so great to see everyone here It's my pleasure to introduce the business and leadership navigating challenges and embracing opportunities panel. But before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about Cafeta in case you haven't heard before. You check out the video here for a moment. Um Cafeta is currently under construction in the Signal neighborhood of Addis Ababa. It's 105 units ranging from two bedrooms all the way to penthouses. We have a table there where Marty is hosting. So if you have any questions, go on, she can tell you all about it. Today for our panelists, we have Zawud Dabbaba, Chief Human Capital Officer of Pact. Thomas Dabbas, Managing Director, Chief Partnerships Officer, Office of Global Partnerships at the US Department of State. Aryam Yitbarak Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer at MedStar Washington Hospital Center and Samuel Alamayo Managing Director of Cambridge Industries welcome to the stage Thank you Naya All right come on up join us speakers thank you for joining us um this is an important conversation I say this because Um I have a daughter and I have I have a son you know uh we came, when we came I guess my generation it was a different um uh, different time uh, in a lot of ways many of us didn't really have the connection the resources when we were going to college we didn't even know I didn't even know how to apply for college when I graduated from high school um and then when you get out the network is not there to say hey you should consider this do you want to go to law school do you want to go to this do you want to go to that I can help you that uh was not there and it made it a little bit of challenging when we're starting of our career and building ourselves to say hey where should i go i want to be in a leadership position how could i get there those uh support systems were not there so it was a little bit difficult so i'm hoping by having these conversations we're raising our children differently our children are much much better off than we were so i'm hoping that we will see them in senates we see them in c suits everywhere and in governors offices we have big dreams for our children and the fact that that we are here we're talking about these kinds of things this would give them that opportunity to to strive and get to wherever they need to get with that in mind i want to start off all of you are from different industries which is which is wonderful um let me get uh, the beginning of the question b how did you so did you in human resources how did you uh, first have you always wanted to be in this industry if not how did you get into that industry that you're in something that was informed by what i was experiencing at that time which is like you said a large number of us who had immigrated to the us and this is the early 80s uh and i was watching all these people around me including my father my mother and a whole lot of others who had advanced degrees who worked professionally in their uh countries and other places and here we are beginning of the 80s and nobody could find a job that was even entry level in connection to their professions and so that was always at the back of my mind okay so once i got into grad school i had initially started uh in a public health program uh that wasn't really working out for me <laughs> So mm-hmm. I decided to go into human resources just to take a class in human resources because I wanted to better understand why all these people were not getting jobs while at the same time being in school I was hearing my schoolmates talking about their parents, their cousins uh who were on an ongoing basis getting jobs. So that really informed how I got into uh, human resources. Interesting. Thomas, you're in government. a whole different whole different industry how did you get started i i no, i don't think i ever thought i will be at the us department that was never on my radar actually i wanted to be like sam <laughs> uh, to this day i still want to be like 
But in any way, I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but um, sometimes career, careers chose you in the sense of then choosing them. Mm-hmm. Like you have opportunities, certain doors opens for you and do that. But never, I mean, uh, as an immigrant, uh, an institution that gave me visa to come yeah. in this country for me to go work for it, it was not yeah. even my radar. Like, yeah. you know? And so uh, that is my story. Is I, I was a trained economist, uh, you know, attempted to be an entrepreneur. Then I went into an institution, a government institution, thinking that I'm going to get uh, money for, for me to grow. Uh, what I came out of it is not, it's not money, but job. <laughs> that this is how my kind of my career comes. How you got started, Doctor Arya? Recently, doctor, right? Yes. How thank did you, you get started? You're a nurse. So oh, yes, my okay. background. I'm a nurse. Um, I always wanted to know. I want. I wanted to go in healthcare, um, and kind of made a deliberate decision of like, you know, do I want to be a doctor, pharmacist, nurse, and kind of choose the nurse route. Um, it's. Uh, I'm a social butterfly. I like to talk. I like to interact with people. So when I looked at the different opportunities within healthcare, I thought nursing fit my personality. So that's how I started. Um, that how I decided to go to nursing school. Um, and after that, I think just again my um, personality. Um, I would say I'm the youngest of four girls, and people think I'm the oldest because I have uh, some born leadership qualities and kind of. <laughs> migrated that way yeah yes amazing and so you start out on a nurse and then you end up where you end up sam private industry right so tell us your background a little bit yeah so for me it's really i've always wanted to start businesses be around those that are starting businesses but it was reinforced when i went to college that environment especially at the at stanford it's the bug in there. It's encouraged. Uh, you're surrounded by others that have done it. Um, and so my life has been this revolving door, either starting companies or supporting others that are starting companies in a form of as an investor, uh, an advisor, board member. So, you know, when you find your own like-minded people that continuously reinforce that, um, it's, uh, it's that's, as I say, the startup bug that is inside you, you cannot get rid of and, and continuously find myself uh, running and starting businesses. That's great. Um, I like vision. I like having a vision. And uh, especially in, in professional settings, if we don't have a roadmap of where we want to get, if you kind of don't map that out, uh, sometimes you're, not, you're aiming at, at everything and nothing, correct? So what, did you have a specific roadmap? Is there something that you said, you know what, I'm going to be here for, for this period of time, then, then my next vision is to be here, my next vision is to be there. Was there like a specific strategy or a roadmap that you followed within your career? So I'll start with you. So uh, I've really pondered that question quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with full honesty, I did not have a roadmap. Because okay. as you suggested earlier, you know, we came at a time uh, where we did not really have people who could guide us and mentor us um, so that we could better understand how to assimilate into the needs and the requirements of uh, the system. In hindsight, uh, there is a roadmap. Okay. Uh, and I think the way that question comes up in my head is do we build the road and then the map or do we draw a map and the road? And in my case, it's really the road that came first. But in hindsight, there are some key things they really help me stay on that path, mm-hmm. which, like you said, avoids the uh, uh, get derailed or detouring off too far. And it really consists of uh, discipline uh, and uh, being able to get criticism, be open to it. So as we go along and we find opportunities that correct us from getting back on our paths, it's really paying attention to that and not taking it personally to a point where we don't really take advantage of the things that can help us make the adjustments so we can get back on uh, track. At this okay. point, there are certain things that, I mean, I could draw a roadmap of how I got here, but it would be misleading to say that I really had an idea of how I was going to go from one step to another. That's great. Thomas, did you have a strategy? Yeah, I, I, I actually um, really spent a lot of time thinking about what you're describing, foresight. Do you have the foresight to think about that? There's a great proverb from Uganda that says, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you. That's true. Because you can just get. You don't know where you're going. <laughs> so for me, it wasn't 
The destination wasn't a career, it was a purpose. Meaning, I preferred earlier on, since even when I was in high school, even in the yeah, I wanted to have a purposeful life. I wanted to have a reason for me to continue to. Um, so that drove me, that was my compass, that was my North Star in anything that, that came to me. So every opportunity that I got in my career, that is what I brought back to. Is this going to be a purposeful thing for me to add value for it? Clearly it would add value to me, that's not a question, but would I add value to it? And I think when you have that type of direction, then the, the vision becomes 2020, so to speak, because already you take the burden of, you know, that when we were kids, we keep being told, what do you want to be? And I have said this before, I wanted to be a pilot because that's the only thing that I knew. I knew Samuel wanted to be one too. Uh, and, but, it was, but that, it was just any high, right? Because I was the best thing you can have. Yep, yep. that was being a Gip Airlines pilot. But once the, your aperture opens, and especially for those of us who are fortunate enough to live in America, to have this opportunity, then you cannot waste that opportunity just randomly going in life. Mm. Some hope is not a strategy, as they say. You gotta have a purpose, you gotta have a, a direction. And then after that, the blessings of your mother will take you to where you need to. That's right. I am. So I would say for me, I think I've always known I wanted to be in leadership. Um, as a new graduate nurse, um, I remember when I was coming off orientation, which is like after three months of training, the director said to me, where do you want to be in five years? Uh, and I said, um, I don't know, maybe in a different specialty or in your position. <laughs> and I think she was shocked when I said that to her. But I, 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 like I said, I always knew I wanted to be in leadership. So I kind of followed that path. Uh, but when I went back to school to do my master's, I wanted to, I was deliberate in doing my master's in healthcare administration rather than nursing, because I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in hospital setting or just broaden my, my uh, opportunities um, outside hospitals. Nurses are everywhere. I mean, in government, in law offices, they are everywhere. So I wanted to be deliberate about my, my decision. But once I started that pathway of being a leader, I just kept growing and growing. Um, and even today, if you ask me, where do I want to go is I'm brand new in my job right right now but I want to continue to grow right around the hospital I mean I want to be the first nurse president for MedStar because all of the presidents are for the 10 hospitals are either business people or physicians um, so you know my vision is still going I have no doubt that you will get there <laughs> <laughs> Sam so, so I, I want to build up on what Tommy said where for me, it really depends kind of the foresight and the aspiration that you have really changed drastically depending on the situation you're in, the role models that you see. So growing up in Ethiopia, yeah, I kind of liked wanting to be a pilot, but for me, there was a guy named Atwa Asrat in our neighborhood and he was, he had that baby Fiat and he was the guy that everybody looked up to and he had Wolf uh the sawmill. Like I really wanted to own my own Wolf Chobaint one day. I mean, that was like growing up. That was aspiration, the entrepreneur that is going to do that. Good for you. I came here, go to Stanford, in my dorm room, uh, individuals that I had known kind of closely were starting YouTube. Like, and, and we're looking at it right there. And my ability to see it, can I do that? Can I do something, my level of aspiration, the type of problem that I think I could solve grows dramatically. But a lot of the ones that you genuinely believe you could do, are those that you could relate to, especially when you have mentors and sponsors that have done that, uh, that show you that you could also do it, then all of a sudden, the level of aspiration that you have on what you could solve astronomically goes up. And as an entrepreneur, like my task and my job is how do I solve what is the most pertinent problem at any given time? And the scale of that problem also grew with the exposure that I got. Yeah, interesting. ካቾቻችን እንግዲህ ከራፍት ቆይታችን ተመልሰናል ለምትመለከቱት ያላችሁት በኤምፓወር ዘ ኮሚኒቲ ዊክኤንድ ሰባተኛው አመታዊ ዝግጅት ላይ ከቀረበው አንደኛው ፓነል ዲስከሽን ቢዝነስና ሊደርሺፕ ላይ ያተኮረው ነው እስቲ ወደዛ እንደገና ደሞ ልሰዳችሁ 
So this next question to me, especially as Ethiopian and Eritrean immigrants, um, I feel like we struggle a little bit about it. It's self-advocacy in any environment, but it's specifically uh, professionally. Uh, I know when I first started out, I was just like, oh, let my, let the, my work speaks for itself. I don't want to, you know, I, I, my boss is looking at it, what time I come in, what time I leave, and the quality of my work. So they're going to give me the promotion. They're going to give me this. No, I discovered very quickly that is not how this corporate America works in the US. Uh, and so tell me the role self-advocacy plays. What does that look like for you, especially for minorities like us in a culture that grew up, oh, you need to be humble, don't brag, don't boast, you know, be quiet, which is, you know, just don't be bragging about yourself. Tell me this, the role that self-advocacy plays for us and how should we be doing, especially from an HR perspective, you'll have a different you know, uh, way, but talk about that. The first step is really understanding what advocacy is. Advocacy is about asking for something that we need uh, with uh, an objective understanding of an outcome that we want. Okay. So in my experience, advocacy is sometimes misinterpreted to be aggression mm -hmm. versus assertiveness to ask for what we want. So the things that are really important in terms of that assertiveness is number one, understanding what we really want. Understanding the data is, are we basing what we're asking for based on solid data? Because I can tell you there are times when people feel that they need to be at a different level. Uh, however, what's missing is the data in terms of their own, what they bring, their background, their experience, in relationship to the position that they're interested mm -hmm. in. Uh, and that is a critical point because that begins to compromise uh, the value of what's being said when the speaker is not really speaking in connection to something that is transparently uh, an action the company can take. Mm -hmm. So really differentiating between aggression, uh, which normally comes in the form of complaints, without really an outcome that's attached to it. And mm -hmm. the expected outcomes and requests to better understand what the person can do to be prepared for the next level, I think is an important part of uh, advocacy and gives credibility to what we're asking. Yeah. That's a great point. For me, I think um, competency is first important. Right? You can't advocate for yourself if you're not competent in the work that you do. But I discovered earlier on uh, from the beautiful game, from soccer, even when I was in Addis, that those who got to be picked up to play the game, those who picked up to become captains were the ones who were vocal, who demanded the ball, distributed the ball, who commanded the, the game. So I knew earlier on that I cannot be timid, especially when, we, what do they say, when you, when you're in Rome, be like the Romans. Um, <laughs> when you are in an environment, you know, we're no longer any different, let's be very clear. So if you're in America, then you have to understand that ecosystem, that you have to be competent. There is a fierce competition for talent. So therefore, then how do I then create the kind of the ecosystem the collaboration that I need for not only for you to advocate yourself, but others will advocate for you. Clearly seeing your leadership skills on that. Mm. So I think that the mentality that you not only have to be on people's space, it's not the question of being arrogant, it's actually being vocal about the, the we part of it. People think by saying I, I, I need to be from it and all that, that is not a, a quality of a leadership. Leadership starts with the we. That's true. But once we start including people, and then the people will actually put you in a, in a, in a position of influence for you to do so. That has been my personal experience. Um, so I will add to what Thomas said, and I think earlier, Helen, you said you used to work hard and let think that the work will show for yourself. So that's competency, but without the advocacy or without being willing to step forward or take a, branch, a project that's going to stretch you or be willing to present things when something is, you know, an opportunity comes is how you advocate. And again, you have to know, you have to be competent, you have to be able to understand and influence um, uh, 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 people's thoughts about, especially with immigrants, will tend to be viewed as quite and timid and not bold. And, you know, again, when in Rome, be Rome, but when in America, like, adapt to the culture, regardless of what culture will come from, you have to absolutely be authentic, be proud of your culture, but when you're in a specific environment, you have to adapt to that culture and be, you know, assembled to that culture, yeah. Mm. 
So. I mean, I want to build on my my fellow panelists have said, but I want to bring it back into the earlier question that you raised, which is very important. When you are having this aspiration, this foresight of this is where I want to be, what are the actions that I need to take to get me there? Um, but sadly, in our culture, in the Abisha culture, we really have this extremely pervasive thing. I mean, even when you look at the site, you Yeah. A lot of the things really tells you, no, step back, do not aspire, be comfortable where you are. And, and if you're going to step up to that aspiration that you have set, you have to take a leap of faith. You really have to put yourself out there. And, and you have to know that that is okay. Uh, so again, kind of went wrong, but even in Ethiopia, that's a culture that I think we need to change. Like, it's just, we want people to be able to, we need to really reward those that take risk, that really are putting themselves out there uh, and, and trying to create things. And, and at the end of the day, it is setting the plan and, and putting yourself out there and putting the work to meet that plan. Mm. Can I just add to Sure. I love what Sam just said. And I think um, we are the stories we tell ourselves we yeah, are. Yeah. I want to repeat that. We are the stories we tell ourselves we are. So it becomes embedded into your subconscious about the timidness that you're talking about. So therefore, the greatest superpower you can have is to unlearn yep. the things we grew up with. Like mm -hmm. the stuff that he was talking about. Yeah. Subconsciously, it's been embedded in your mind to keep you back. How do you undo that? Mm -hmm. It's the better of not just yourself, but your community and your family. So I think that's an important point. That's yeah. This is a good segue for my next question, which is, um, what part of you, I think when I was younger, especially whether it was in college when I first started out, I thought I had to assimilate. I had to be like the Americans. I have to, gosh, I wish I didn't have this accent so I could sound just like them. You know, like you, there's that pressure that you put yourself as an immigrant. However, we need to kind of maintain and balance that cultural identity, that authenticity of what we bring to the table is actually very unique uh, and, and also very much needed in whatever space that we're in. So how do you balance that? And especially if you're in an ind industry that is predominantly white, predominantly American, how do you balance that cultural identity? And I'll start, um, mix it up a little bit. I'll start with you, Sam. How do you balance that? Yeah, I mean, you say the word, it's authenticity. If you're not authentically yourself, if you do not identify to who you are inside, it, you, cannot, you cannot stand and then present yourself originally and, and others are not going to respect you. So at the end of the day, that authenticity is extremely important. And, and, and the other part is, we cannot change our skin. Um, and, and it's extremely important. I'm extremely proud of my origin in Ethiopia and our origin in, in East Coast of Africa and all of Africa. But at the end of the day in America, um, we also need to I, embrace a lot of the work and with, with the HR side as well of making sure that we're also bringing up others uh, within the African-American community within our larger community, that supports the, the best mentors I've ever had were African-American mentors that saw themselves in me and, and were able to and inspire me to be able to do that. So when I was building my identity, I needed to identify and then build my Ethiopian identity as well as my African-American identity, the fact that I'm here, I'm living here, and, uh, and it manifests itself in the way you present yourself, in the way you interact with others, and, 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 and who you advocate for. And then start advocating for myself as well as the larger community at all times. I am, how do you uh, so, leverage your yeah, authenticity? So, I mean, I would say, again, you, you have to be authentic. I mean, you have to be proud of where, we, where you come from and you have to speak up. So I usually will comment and say, well, you know what? I think I have a different experience. So this is how I view X, Y, and Z. And eventually, again, we are, we're in DC. I mean, the, it's an international center, right? So then your input becomes more and more valuable where they can come back and ask you like, oh, like, how do you think this is going to be received by the immigrant workforce that we have or by the African-American community that we have? So um, it's not, you know, again, just be, um, don't shy away, speak up, be mindful about 
you know equity and diversity and but but more importantly belonging like yeah. so like you have to be you have to talk about it you cannot be shy about it i'm always the first one to say well i don't get that joke i don't get it i don't grow up in america right so like i'm not trying to make them uncomfortable but i'm not just gonna sit there and pretend that i understood the joke that they referenced because i don't but i also know like i'll be the first one to talk about football on a monday morning because i'm a football fan and then that kind of creates an uh, an, uh, um, um, an environment or an assimilation where people are like oh i can relate to this person i can relate to that person but again never lose yourself yeah okay so. um I, I think that what we need to start as an immigrant community, the first thing is we stand on the broad shoulders of the African American. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes we forget about that. Oh, for That's sure. So when you say identity, to me is that the African American experience is now, has become our experience. Yeah. Especially in the midst of the, the Supreme Court decision that recently happened, yeah. mm -hmm. that has been, been talked about a lot. Uh, we need to be thinking about from diversity from that perspective, right? And the other thing is obviously I'm in the, in the diplomacy uh, um, space. Uh, who represents America is not sometimes the face of America. And it's true. I must say that at least this administration and the department seems to have emphasized that they want diplomats to look like America, meaning the face of America, including mine and others. And I think being comfortable with this notion, one of the things I never understood, people talk about the imposter syndrome. Is something I really never understood that mm. because not to say I, I uniquely have uh, an overemphasized ego or confidence in it, but I think once you recognize you are a fabric of a broader community, the African American community, the African diaspora community, and all those kind of things, then you must recognize that you belong. If I know what I belong, then why would I feel like I don't belong in that world? Mm -hmm. So again, these are the stories we've told ourselves that we don't belong. Therefore, then it creates a subconscious disadvantage for you to walk in. Not to say there are not systemic barriers mm -hmm. for that to do that, but let the detractors be your enemy, not yourself be yep. the enemy of yourself, you know. the enemy of kind of your progress. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for us to recognize the brand that we is more than the community that yep. we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Great and point. I really appreciate that. Uh, we are actually also fortunately at a time when leveraging our diversity and leveraging our background uh, has space and an uh, influence um, and also relevance to the business because the more we can tie in the importance of our heritage to the bigger business mm -hmm. necessity uh, and bring it not just making it a social cause but as far as organizations are concerned they do care about the bottom line. And the bottom line is we have a very diverse population. Uh, we've got a very diverse workforce. And how is the importance of, for the organization being able to leverage the diversity of the workforce so that the populations that they're trying to serve are able to, uh, to relate? Um, and I'll just share a very uh, quick story. Uh, at some point in my career, uh, we I worked for an organization that was sending baby food uh, overseas uh, in the form of aid. Mm. And the organization, completely unaware of the implications, sent baby food with pictures of a baby on it. And this food was being sent to a country where people normally, or to a part of a country where people normally looked at the pictures and it told them what was in the container. So when you get baby food with a picture of a baby on it, it wasn't well received because as far as they were concerned what was in the container was actually babies and not baby food oh mm -hmm. my gosh so the importance of really the global connections uh i think now put us in a place uh where we do make an impact on the outcome of our businesses Mm. Very interesting. Interesting story. This is a place in the setup. We have a lot of This is our first time. We have a lot of 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 time. One of the best events. We have a lot of time. We have a lot of time. We have a lot of time. We have a lot of ተመልካቾቻችን እንግዲህ ከራፍት ቆይታችን ተመልሰናል ለምትመለከቱት ያላችሁት በኤምፓወር ዘ ኮሚኒቲ ዊክንድ ሰባተኛው አመታዊ ዝግጅት ላይ ከቀረበው አንደኛው ፓነል ዲስከሽን ቢዝነስና ሊደርሺፕ ላይ ያተኮረው ነው እስቲ ወደዛ እንደገና ደሞ ልሰዳችሁ 
So Sam, this is specific for you. You're an entrepreneur and you've been in, in that space for a long time. Uh, can you share any specific strategies or approaches that you've used to navigate the potential biases that you see in the investment community? Because that's different, especially uh, not just a, a, a black uh, American, like an American here now, but an African. Yep. There's these biases, especially in that space that you're in. Uh, can you talk about that? How did you navigate that? Yeah, no, um, that's a really important question. Kind of, I want to step back just a little bit also, kind of adding to the earlier part and connecting this. Mm. There is our unique identity mm. can also be used as a bridge to show everybody's unity. And, and, and the fact that we come from the home of Lucy, it's the home of all humankind. It's, um, you know, uh, Tommy always says, it's homecoming. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and at the end of the day, we're all kind of the same. And, and to really emphasize that in the investment world, especially in Silicon Valley, it is not easy. When I started out first working even as an investor at Venrock, in the top 15 VC firms at the time, there were a handful, like there were two black people working and I was a junior associate coming in and the other person was Colin Powell, which was only a venture partner kind of Perkins. So you did not see a whole lot of people that look like you. It has changed a lot now. Uh, but not significantly. So what you're looking for is there's a lot more unity you know, outside of your, uh, your race or your gender. It's usually, for me, what has helped a lot were mentors and sponsors that I've had. Uh, when I was working, I usually have worked with others before I started my own. And when I transitioned, they have known a lot of the investors that ended up investing. They've known me for years. Um, or when I was working as an investor, a lot of the relationships that I've built, um, it's usually being able to have those, and it's really important to get that first money. And then later on, the more money you make people, they usually kind of tend to forget whatever you look like and, and, and it will follow you. It's that track record. Uh, but then you gotta pay that forward and it ends up affecting you and, and supporting you in immense ways. So at the end of the day, kind of the key things are those relationships, those mentorship, and track record. Go and deliver and the money will follow. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so as, um, I guess people kind of see you guys here sitting uh, on this stage, your leaders in your industries, uh, and people just assume, oh my gosh, I'm sure they've made all the right decisions, but that's not true for anyone, right? <laughs> Uh, we learn so much more from our mistakes or some of our bad decisions versus from all of our successes. So if you could be op open, as open as you want to be, um, what mistakes did you think or learning opportunities have you had um, that you think would be valuable for our viewers to, to hear, something that you've learned from? So Ariam, I'll start with you. Oh, God. It's, it's really hard to pick one because as leaders, as human beings, we make mistakes. And I say, I'm gonna make a mistake, tell me when I make a mistake and I'm gonna own it. As a leader, I think that's one of the most important qualities you have to have is owning your mistake, being uh, humble, and um, um, you know, uh, being vulnerable. So the team can see that you're able to be vulnerable and make mistakes and it's okay that they could make a mistake and it's totally fine. It's really difficult to ask for, but I'll tell you, uh, so this is, um, Many, I was a brand new, a fairly new leader, I should say, uh, at 20 years ago. And um, uh, we, I had a, a, an employee that was um, non-compliant, was taking care of a patient. <laughs> Very diplomatic. Uh, huh? Very diplomatic. <laughs> Very diplomatic, yes, as uh, we try to be. Um, and I was giving her feedback, giving her feedback, but the patient was at risk for fall, right? And she wouldn't, and I was like, I, I got frustrated. I mean, very immature of me, right? I'm the manager, I said, <laughs> <laughs> and she wasn't listening. So, but like, I went home, I do a lot of reflection, I, of like, every day. I mean, I reflect, three o'clock in the morning, I think about something, I wake up, I download it. I say I download my brain because I email myself so I can go back to sleep. Um, so that was like one of the things I was like, I need to be, I need to lead differently. Authority is not going to make anybody do anything, really influence, trust, and helping people understand what the right thing is. 
you show them the right thing, they will do the right thing. Nobody comes to work trying to do the wrong thing. I truly believe that. But some people just don't know what the right and wrong is. And it's our responsibility to educate them. So from then I'm like, okay, like pointing out what people are doing wrong is not the right way. Showing them how to do it right is the right way. So I think I continue to learn. I'm sure I will continue to make mistakes in the future. And again, we have to also, I think that's the most important thing is knowing that we will make mistakes. And then again, owning the mistake. That's great. Thomas. Um, I mean, it's probably going to take me another hour. Oh, <laughs> Lord, we don't have, have that. that. <laughs> I have a portfolio of oil and gas with one of those. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of them. But I think one of them in my early career was that I, I remember when I left my first job. And I thought I was really killing it, meaning like the job. The, you the thought you were it. I mean, I was it. And I thought like the, the, the agency that I was leaving literally would have collapsed when I leave. Like, what are they going to do when I leave? <laughs> and I remember within a week or two, I had to make a phone call back to them. And I literally have to reintroduce myself again. It was like, <laughs> nothing has happened. Like, literally, what, everything that I thought of. So that not only my ego got checked, but I understood at that point that I am not my job. Like, the job is going to move on with or without me. These institutions have no soul. They're just bodies of organizations that do that. So I realized earlier on, I should not have any kind of strong affinity to that kind of the work. And the second one is something we continue to suffer in, is about the question of focus. Because we, I mean, when you realize opportunities are vast, especially now, the barrier to entry to do a lot of things have lowered so much, and I envy the new generation, you do not know when to say, I am not going to do that. There is a thing in the strategy. It's not, in, whether it's business strategy or policy strategy, whatever, it is not about what you do. The most important thing is what you do not do. And to accept that I shall not do that, mm. it's almost to take the joy of saying no. Mm. Right? That's Just true. saying, having, be happy about, mm. you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that and do that and do that. I'm just going to focus. I'm going to do X. That is a thing that we all struggle and these are mistakes we all make. Uh, but in the process, we have to acknowledge that, you know, it's, it's again, it's the loss of physics that you can't occupy two spaces at the same time. That's true. You have to be here or there. You can't be at two places. That's true. Zaud, what mistakes? Uh, so, uh, I too have... Two. Are we good? Go ahead. Oh. Okay. Uh, I too can actually spend many hours talking about the same, uh, especially with connection to dealing with yeah. human stuff, mm -hmm. which is really the most uh, pertinent part of the work I do. Uh, I think the mistakes I made was not choosing the right metaphors, mm -hmm. but I've learned over time it's just because a person is good at one thing doesn't mean that they're good at everything else. And what I've learned is to identify a metaphor that's the right fit for what I do. So if I'm focusing on exercising, then I need to find a mentor who has actually gone through that experience and is going to teach me how I can better figure it out. And I was also quite to the one thing I needed as a manager is very different than the one thing I need as a leader. It's very different than the mentor I need as a well, doing all the technical aspects of uh, my job. So it's really being able to choose wisely and choose based on uh, actually having observed a person in that space uh, versus just making assumptions. Um, so That's how you do it. That's how I do it now. I love it. So. Um, I, I can give you my mistake. I got, I got millions you of got them. You got a million. Right? Oh, but I, I'm going to give you just one. Okay. So for me, start like in the world of uh, startups and, and, and as an entrepreneur, the one key thing that I've learned is for my first startup, that attachment that you have with your idea and with your business and especially it manifests itself and talking about it, it's like, oh, it's my baby and, and kind of humanizing it. Horrible mistake because I have three kids. If you told me that my baby is ugly, it doesn't matter if they are. You're not my friend. Yeah. <laughs> because you know I'm not gonna take any kind of you know rational, uh, um, objective view on what's working and, and it's not working. So it was very important to really separate and not have that type of humanistic relationship to that business. And what I ended up approaching it is it's almost like creating, testing an airbag. 
this is an idea okay it could work this way let me try it this is a scenario how do i simulate that smash it to the wall if it doesn't work okay great what do i need to fix what do i need to change smash it to the wall again oh if it refuses to fail then i have a success so really separating my own identity and uh relationship from my ideas and saying this is just a solution that i'm trying to create to the problem that i'm trying to address it is now my business so that i have a flexible move fast break things but most importantly fail quickly and and reiterate as much as possible that was kind of a very important lesson that i have to learn the heart okay so in the interest of time that's a great answer Ethiopian. Kuta fashion now. Lolal is behind promoting Ethiopian uh, honey. Ruby Balal. Alliance Care Nawi Balal. The Artec Solution. African inspired Tari Kunana. History in Hulu. Miguel Jewelry brand now. Abu Gida School La Mastok no Zemetano. A hot sauce company. We tell you gold plate of jewelry in Omanagarabo. ተመልካቾቻችን እንግዲህ ከረፍት ቁበታችን ተመልሰናል ለምትመለከቱት ያላችሁት በኤምፓወር ዘ ኮሚኒቲ ዊክንድ ሰባተኛው መታዊ ዝግጅት ላይ ከቀረበው አንደኛው ፓነል ዲስከሽን ቢዝነስ እና ሊደርሺፕ ላይ ያተኮረውን ነው እስቲ ወደዛ እንደገና ደሞ ልሰዳችሁ In the interest of time what practical advice do you guys give to someone that's potentially stuck in middle management they are not moving anywhere they might be in big corporation big government agency uh and they feel like okay i don't know which way to go which way to look uh what opportunities what advice would you give to that person i'll start with you so i think it's first to really understand what leadership is is it really leadership you want or are is it management because the skills that are required for both are really different I use very little of my management skills really in a more strategic role which is about uh problem solving it's about people it's really looking at the soft skills whereas the management skills are a little bit more precise you conduct you know your assigned work you monitor work you conduct performance reviews um and so is it that really what you want and is it really the best fit for your personality and your ability to relate to people to be able to live with ambiguous situations that don't always have a solution um so that would be is it really what you want and if if that is what you want learn more about leadership before you make that as your next option for growth because there's just so many different ways we can grow some of it is horizontal some of it is really pivoting into uh other careers or even uh especially in these days as a consultant if you have very strong technical skills Uh, and I'll add just one other thing getting into a position is the first step being able to stay there is something totally different and so when we look for the opportunities for promotion uh is it it's not just that they will be celebrated the real work comes after that and that's why it's really important to really understand what it is that we are making a commitment to that's great practical advice yes um so I'll use a a, a kind of a common denominator we all have which is being immigrants We are done an amazing job um adapting to a new place a completely foreign land and essentially we've done we've done a good job being an immigrant of a space a place what i would suggest to be an immigrant of time meaning be comfortable with your future so if you can foresee yourself 5 years from now whatever 10 years from now and imagine what that person looks like when you have that empathy with yourself in some future state that gives you a very clear mandate on what you ought to do to be comfortable in making that because that kind of daydreaming that kind of thinking and at least some people might tell you are you lost in mind what are you talking about no it is being an immigrant of time essentially just it's a it's a, a strange land for you because the future has not happened yet but be comfortable with that notion then you will start i, I always say to my students i dearly miss the future because when you talking about nostalgia especially we always think about nostalgia being a past but why don't we to be looking for it miss the future because the future is can be bright because you have significant amount of agency making it happen 
So if you get comfortable with your future self being better than today, then that positive mental state gives you the construct to be successful. So be an immigrant of time. Well, that's bad, Arya. So, I mean, you said if people are stuck in middle management, what advice do I have? So I think I would say the first thing is they need to like assess like, are they being passed on or are there qualities or skills that they need to develop to be able to promote it or get that opportunity when they need it? So I think they need to, that needs to be kind of figured out. But if they are being passed on, I would say people, I, generally speaking, we are, um, we're risk averse and we don't take risk and move to different organizations or be willing to do lateral moves, right? So if you feel like you're stuck in an organization or in a, on a, uh, under a specific service line, I would say move to the next department, right? Move to a, ne a next division, move to a next organization, take a risk and be willing to take that leap to, so it can give you an opportunity to grow. Um, but if, there's, if there are skills, education, whatever you need to, to better prepare yourself, then also take that opportunity. Don't think somebody's going to give it to you. Yeah, that's fantastic. But I just want to pause. Immigrant of time. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag immigrant of time. That is just, oh God, spot on. The usual Thomas. Um, I think at the end of the day, do you really want to grow? Uh, do you want that position? So, so as you say, ask yourself, is that really what, what you want to do? And at the end of the day, if that is what you want to do, and you've said it beautifully, do you have the skills? Do you need to develop and work on those skills? Is those that need to support you and, uh, and the sponsors and the mentors that are needed to get you there, are they there in that organization? If not, especially as immigrants, we know how to migrate and move to a better pasture. So just kind of migrate and uh, find somewhere else that really values the amazing authenticity like if you believe in what you're going to offer you want to be in a place that respects that and allows you to grow knows where you want to be and is willing to take you um so at the end of the day it's questioning that and being able to work on it and and finding uh the right place to make that a reality all right so last question fire round answer what are you doing to continue to ensure to grow and develop as a leader because there's no such thing as you have arrived right so what are you doing? Uh, I very strongly trust the process of mentoring. Uh, I've got a great mentor who's mentored me through many stages of my life uh, and continues to mentor me. So mentoring is really an important part. Participating in things outside of uh, my work, uh, volunteer work, uh, just accessing many other uh, avenues to, lo to, to learn more. That's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. For me, um, I'm teaching at uh, GW Liu and Virginia Tech. Teaching is learning. I am actually doing it to learn. So reading and, and kind of consuming knowledge is an ever evolving kind of thing. So that's the kind of, that's my new thing is, is teach so to learn, not in a sense need to share information to actually learn. So I think for me, there's two ways, right? So there's that academics, right? And I just finished my uh, doctorate from GW uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, so that is a formal education on helping me to on how to, um, you know, that textbook uh, education. But there's also the experience on how you continue to be a better leader. So for me, it's spending time with the people that I lead understanding them and learning from them because I can't lead anyone if I don't if I don't understand them so that is the most important thing I do I you know I'm in professional organizations um, I read I listen to you know different things so but I'm willing more important the most important thing is I'm willing to listen to learn from others to make me a better leader because I never arrive right because we are lifelong learners and we have to be willing to no, to be lifelong learners. If you think you've arrived, then you have failed as a leader. Mm. Yep. Good answer. Yeah, I mean, in this time of age that we live in right now, the only constant is change. So, so you really need to adapt to that. So the three things you gotta continuously work on, or I continuously try to work on, is improve the mind, as learning and, and continuously engaging, improve the body, try to take care of yourself as much as possible, and, and always um, improve that because you're not going to be great if, if you're not continuously improving that and, and, and improving the spirit. Uh, learning new ways. Uh, I've just now adopted uh, breathing techniques and, and breath works. 
uh, which has been kind of extremely important for me and and spending as much time as possible with my own family so that I'm developing my own authenticity, my own uh, personal spiritual path. So the mind, the body, and the spirit. That's a perfect way to end. Thank you very much. This was a wonderful discussion. Round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Bahulat Shiharat Ramo, Empower the Community Weekend, Badisawa Nigganai. Badisawa Nigganai. Badisawa Nigganai.